I have the slides. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would first like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, these are my disclosures. I'm representative of a biotech company based in Germany, Maddox Biotechnologies, but I also have two other hats. One is that I'm engaged as a scientist in an activity with the Association of Cancer Immunotherapy and the regulatory research group there, and I'll give also some reports from the work that we've done there. And I'm also coordinating an industry academic consortium funded by European Union, which is engaging into personalized vaccines. Uh, I've been asked today to give you an overview on strategies in personalized vaccine development, and specifically also at the end give some summary and policy recommendations on this. So I'm very much looking forward to these next 19 minutes. First question is, why should we personalize? I think we've heard today a number of really good arguments to do that. The way we look at that is really right from the start, and that's what's presented to the immune system. What you see here looks a little like prehistoric cave drawings, but for me it's actually one of the most significant advancements in, advancements in immunology. That's the drawing by Hansgaard Ramanzi in 1991, which led to a series of uh, landmark papers where he described with others how class one and class two peptides are presented to the immune system. And this really started um, an investigation of more than 20 years um, that we did and, and also um, in academia as well as in the company. So what we're interested in is really what we call the entirety of the immunopeptidome. I think we've heard today a lot about MHC or HLA-restrictive peptides. Uh, what we like to look at is not only at single peptides, but look at as much as possible, as far as possible, at the entirety of the peptides presented by, to the immune system. That's what we call the immunopeptidome. And we'd like to map that as far as possible, not only on tumor tissues, <clears throat> but also the immunopeptidome on human normal and healthy tissues to really understand the differences. Um, the way we've attempted to do that is with a platform called ExpressZone Platform, which has been um, developed by Tony Weinschenk, who, is, um, um, who was also working with Hanska Gramenzi and, and is a uh, co-founder of Ematics. And what Tony and his group does is basically observe um, using high sensitivity, high throughput quantitative mass spectrometry and analyzing a large number of tumor and healthy tissue tilts with various technologies. Um, what's really relevant is what is in the middle. That's sort of the mass spec part. So Tony takes human and uh, human tumor and normal tissue samples, lyses them, isolates the MHC peptide complexes, strip off the peptides. What he gets are hundreds to thousands of peptides in a few microliters. And what he's developed over the past 15 years is really trying to sequence as many peptides as possible de novo using tandem mouse spec, mouse spec. So that's a very high sensitive mouse spec approach. And while originally 10 years ago, he was very happy to sequence one or two peptides from a large 10 gram bulk sample of tumor tissue. Nowadays, he can take as little as 300, 400 milligrams of tumor material, even biopsy material, and sequence hundreds and thousands of peptides from that. Um, in addition, we also complement that on the left side with quantitative transcriptomics, so that's RNA, uh, seq data, originally gene chips, now sort of more RNA seq. And then the third part of the platform is an in vitro immunogenicity platform where we determine for each antigen that we select and sort of determine to be relevant potentially for a therapeutic setting, uh, the immunogenicity and the applicability. This is what the data looks like from Tony's platform. This is an example of a peptide derived. Um, an A2 restricted peptide derived from collagen 6A3. Collagen 6A3 itself is a very unspectacular, unspectacular tumor antigen. It's expressed in connective tissues, so it's all over the place. However, it is known that there is a cancer associated or cancer specific splicing of exon 6, and that exon 6 just appears in cancer tissue or predominantly cancer tissue. And indeed, um, we were able to find a number of peptides um, from called 6A3 exon 6, one of them is shown here on the right side, you see quantitative mass spec signals on various cancer tissues. So you see there's a very varying degree of presentation in, in terms of copy numbers per cell detected by mass spec. On the left side, you see a number of healthy tissues that we have looked at and where we have with, found uh, this peptide only very rarely, uh, once on a spleen and low signal and once on placenta as low signal. So this is what we call a tumor associate, certainly not a tumor specific, but a tumor associate antigen. That's data 
that we have in our database for, for actually thousands or hundreds of thousands of peptides to really understand what the immunopeptidome looks like. In order to understand the relevance of such data, we've looked at studies that actually have seen efficacy or toxicity or both and compared the observation of that efficacy and toxicity to our mass spec data. And we'll also have a poster about this at ACR. Actually, so far, we've been able to describe each efficacy and toxicity signal that has been described in all recent adoptive cell therapy trials. Uh, so this is an example of a study by Dr. Rosenberg, uh, which was published. Um, it's um, a T cell receptor to a well-known CEA peptide, a well-described colorectal cancer antigen. We can confirm that this peptide is indeed detectable, naturally presented by mass spec on gastric cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and colorectal cancer. So these are the bars in red. But we also do observe a significant signal on healthy colon tissue. And that matches the on-target toxicity that was detected in this trial. So there was efficacy, but there was also clear on-target toxicity, which was dose-limiting and, and actually led to a, a premature abrogation of that trial. So that's on-target tox. Another um, potential application of the platform is off-target toxicity. So this is an example that probably most of you are aware of. It's an infamous T cell receptor recognizing Mage A3, which is developed by a company called Adaptimmune. The trial was done by Carl Jun at UPenn. Um, the T cell receptor recognizes Mage A3, which itself is known as a clean antigen. It's a cancer test antigen. On the upper left, you can see there's no expression on RNA level whatsoever on any of these uh, normal tissues except testis. However, when you determine the motive of the T cell receptor through an alanine scan, you will recognize that the T cell receptor itself is not really clean. And that T cell receptor actually cross-reacts and happens uh, to cross-react with another peptide derived from titan. And indeed, we can show that that titan peptide uh, that was cross-reacted, we find easily on heart tissue and muscle tissue, actually five of five primary heart tissues that we've looked at so far, which are hard to come by, had a very strong expression and presentation of that peptide, four or five prime muscle tissues, but also actually bone marrow and um, artery tissues. So this is a T cell receptor that would have not moved forward uh, in our T cell receptor discovery through development because of the cross reactivity signal that you can detect early on, already during the discovery phase. So we try to look at the entire immunopeptidome. We've conducted internally a program called the Human Immunopeptidome Program which has led to a large collection of mass spectra, around 50 million mass spectra from 9,000 MS experiments, analyzing 20 different tumor types and around 40 different normal tissue types, resulting in a quarter of a million unique, mostly HLA-A2 restricted sequences and more than 1,500 that have some degree of association with cancers and that are applicable potentially for therapeutic settings, including personalized settings. And when looking at these, there are a number of observations. Number one, those peptides that are abundantly presented, like the one on the top that's called PDP-03, which we have published, is present in a large number of glioblastomas, unfortunately also low-level presentation on healthy brain. Those peptides that are abundantly presented are often those that are not the most specific. Actually, those peptides that are very specific, peptides coming, for instance, from oncofetal antigens, cancer testis antigens, differentiation antigens, or other types of targets um, are often rarely presented. And thus, they are rather applicable in a personalized setting than for a broader off-the-shelf approach. And secondly, as we've heard of today, um, plenty of times there are also uh, mutinome-derived peptides, so neoantigens, which we can also find. And as we heard, the issue is there are many mutations, but only few of them are actually presented on MHC. And the tool we have with MASPIC allows us a direct validation, which of these neoantigens are actually presented to the immune system. So this is sort of done by sequencing, it's in sequencing. You look at the normal and the cancer uh, mutanome, and then you actually generate uh, a database of fragment spectra that carry all the somatic mutations, which allows you then to actually get a hit on that specific mutation. This uh, we recently published together with Genentech and Nature. It's also important to know that it's not just peptides there or not there. Uh, there are large differences, obviously, in quantitative. Uh, we've built um, our platform to a level that we can do absolute quantitation, so actually determine the copy number per cell. This has just started. We've done it for roughly over 100 different peptides. Uh, this needs to be done with spiking experiments, so it's relatively sophisticated. And we've seen copy numbers of peptides per cell ranging from five 
to 10,000. So 5 to 10 is sort of the, the lower limit of detection, um, but we can do that robustly now. And interestingly, uh, this morning, Dr. Rosenberg mentioned um, that algorithms are inaccurate. So I put that slide in actually to confirm that. Uh, the sif Party algorithm, which was built by Hanska Gramsci originally, um, if you pick a particular antigen here, that's a tumor antigen that's not disclosed, um, and you detect and, and you sort of generate a list with the sif Party algorithm according to score, um, you will actually see that it's not the top score peptides from that algorithm that we find as naturally presented. Um, we actually find them randomly distributed and also different copy numbers. So you can see here, actually, the one here in the middle is the one that we found on 20 different, of 20 or 50 of these non cell lung cancer tissues at highest copy numbers. But this one very at the bottom with a very low score, so predicted not to be binding to HLA2, was found most often by MASPEC in 40 of the 50 tumor samples. So it's important really to look at the natural presented immunopeptide one. So what do we learn from that exercise? Every tumor is different and provides unique antigens. Um, we think that the antigens expressed by each tumor should be ideally assessed in an unbiased fashion. Yes, there are new antigens, but although new antigens are very fashionable at the moment, I can tell you there's more than just new antigens. Uh, actually, Dr. Rosenberg just a few days published that among the patients, melanoma, that he looked at, there were also patients that recognized products that recognized NYE, so GP100 and S62 uh, to a vast uh, proportion. So also these kind of targets are relevant for an individual patient. Um, and you should look at HLA class one and two. And we believe that high sensitive quantitative mass spec allows the robot identification, robust identification of this. So this is feasible for an individual patient in a therapeutic setting, which actually takes us to the next part, and that's sort of personalization. Um, at the regulatory research group of the Association of Cancer Immunotherapy, we looked at various levels of personalization. Uh, this is published um, in 2013 in Nature Biotechnology, sort of a small paper where we describe three different levels, how to personalize immunotherapies. We define stratification, passive personalization, and active personalization. And basically, this is really a function of what kind of biomarkers do you use to determine what kind of drug is given. What's shown on the left side, stratification is what most of you know actually for a long time. I don't really call it personalization, rather stratification, because you don't fit or tailor the drug to the patient. You actually fit the patient to the drug. So you have a drug like um, uh, trastuzumab, and then you check whether HER2 new is expressed and then give the drug. But what is also sort of used a lot is what we call passive personalization. So this is a drug that is not applied based on any biomarker analysis. You don't determine what kind of specific biomarkers are presented to the patient, but rather go through a standardized process and generate a product, such like an autologous product. So it's personalized, but it does not utilize the individual information that you can actually derive from the biomarker analysis of that patient. And TILS is certainly such an example. So passive personalization works very well, but it's not in based on specific information that you uh, derive from biomarkers. This takes me to the last part. That's active personalization. So active personalization takes into account all the biomarkers that you can measure, and then actually tailoring the drug to the patient based on that biomarker analysis. And I'll give you uh, one example for such a study that we are currently conducting, which is called GAPVAC in glioblastoma patients. So this is um, a consortium, um, European Union funded consortium, that is attempting to treat around 20 patients suffering from newly diagnosed glioblastoma. And for each of the patients, we actually generate a specific tailored product based on a number of biomarker analysis. There are two different strategies. One strategy is what we call a warehouse post strategy. So we have collected 71 highly tumor-associated glioblastoma-associated peptides in a warehouse. There are A2, A24, and DR uh, restricted. <clears throat> Patient comes in, undergoes expression analysis, peptidome analysis, but also an individual analysis of the pre-existing genicity to each of these 71 targets. And based on that information, on target expression on the tumor, and immunogenicity in the host immune system, up to 10 peptides from this warehouse, 71 are selected and given to the patient. And then in a second run, that's called APVAC2, uh, we do next generation sequencing, and then actually determine whether we can validate specific mutations, that is new antigens, and then give a second uh, peptide vaccine, up to two peptides, uh, that are derived from such new antigens. Uh, this is a process that's relatively tedious, but it works. So, APVAC1, the, the warehouse-based vaccine is provided 
within three months, the new antigen-based vaccine within six months. So these are times that are far too long, obviously, but it's a start in working on those. Uh, the peptide vaccine is given six to nine times, together with GMCSF and Hiltonol, the same side. Um, we've treated so far um, eight patients. We did three dye runs, and the three patients are currently enrolled. Just to show you here on the top is a comp sort of given the 33 different HLA-A2 restricted peptides and how they distribute um, in the products that we've given to these different patients. So f from these uh, N equals 11 cases, so still a small number, 22 of those 33 peptides were indeed given. In none of these cases we had any peptide was included in all compositions. So indeed, based on that selection algorithm, it is worthwhile going through that exercise because each patient is receiving his or her individual peptide vaccine cocktail. Uh, I'll report data uh, from this clinical trial of first patients at the upcoming ACR uh, meeting. Just a few words in the last minutes going beyond vaccines. Um, we are trying to take this now also beyond vaccines. You can think of our database as a toolbox that can be applied also to other modalities such as adoptive cell therapies. So we see this as a kind of threefold approach based on our target database. We are generating peptide warehouses like we just did in our clinical trial from which we can then manufacture personalized vaccines. Uh, you can also generate a warehouse of multimers that you can use to isolate antigen-specific T cells from individual patients like Dr. Heslop uh, showed this morning um, at Baylor College. Or you can even go so far and generate a warehouse of, for instance, lentiviral express T cell receptors that you could individually apply to patients based on their target expression. Um, these three different approaches are shown here. I think you're pretty familiar with those, so I'll, I'll skip that. Um, just sort of one word on Actolog, what we call Actolog, so endogenous T cells. This has been done by other people. We heard a talk today uh, by Dr. Heslop. Cashin Yi has done this at Fred Hutch. He's taken this to MD Anderson Cancer Center. We're now engaging uh, into a study together with uh, Cashin Yi at MD Anderson to actually uh, do a trial where each patient will receive an adoptive cellular therapy product based on endogenous T cells and personalized to various um, targets. And this will be up to 10 different targets that we'll have in the warehouse. And so the product could have up to four different specificities that are given uh, to the patient. I'll come to the end of my presentation in terms of summary and policy recommendation. So what drives personalization? Well, science does. Our observation does. We observe that there are huge differences in cancer target expression. That drives us to give better drugs and develop better drugs and that there's personalized drugs for patients. Um, these suitable cancer targets occur sometimes only very few patients. They're often they're lowly abundant. And it's not just neoantigens, also non-neoantigens may be highly relevant for individual patients. And we also observe differences in host immune systems. So particularly for approaches with endogenous T cells, this also needs to be looked at. Um, the biomarker-guided personalized immunotherapy may involve selection of suitable patients, which we call stratification, or selection of immunotherapy targets, immunomodulators, or other agents for an individual patient, which we call active personalization. And this is applicable to vaccines, ACT, combination therapies, actually each, every type of um, target-specific uh, immunotherapy. In terms of policy recommendation, we, as the KIMT regulatory research group, uh, had a meeting with the European Medicine Agency EMA Innovation Task Force in 2012. Uh, this is published and it's a supplement to our Nature Biotech paper, so you can read that. And based on that, I would like to make some policy recommendations that were also consensus of that group. So first of all, I've just included that slide actually this morning following our discussion we had. Um, one conclusion we came to is that there are actually no relevant toxicity predicting animal models for HLA restricted peptides. This is a strictly human specific setting. Non-transgenic animals are relevant because they don't carry HLA. But even HLA transgenic animals do not express the relevant components of the human antigen processing machinery. So they may present very different peptides. So if you do see a tox signal, that may be misleading and you may prematurely actually um, disregard a product. And if you don't see a signal, this may also be misleading because you have a false sense of security. So any information derived from such animals, we believe, may be misleading. And this is also, uh, you can read this also not to the radical sense, I've just given that in the paper that um, sort of we conclude together with the EMA Innovation Task Force. So how could we assess toxicity? 
Well, we should first look really in a differentiated way and at on-target and off-target tox. If it's on-target tox, which is applicable largely to any kind of immunotherapy that's target-based, um, a comprehensive study of target expression, so for instance, with a highly sensitive RNA-seq method, and compare that ideally, if that's available to you, with mass spec based peptide presentation data, would give you sort of a relevant data set to really get as close as possible to the truth. I mean, that's what we're doing always in science. We try to uh, approximate uh, the truth. For off-target toxicity, which I postulate here, and that's maybe for our discussion, which is not really relevant for vaccines, endogenous T cells, um, for such T cell receptor-based approaches, uh, one should do determine the motive of the T cell receptor through an alanine scan, and then take that motive and blast it against genomic and peptidomic databases. And if you then do see and observe cross reactivities, like uh, have been described in a Titan paper, then this warrants further studies. But I'm not sure whether any dose escalation here or other measures that have been sort of discussed are really helpful. Rather, sort of um, look at that of target toxicity in the preclinical setting. Specific issues, and I'll come to an end, this is my last slide. With personalized immunotherapies, um, every actively personalized immunotherapy is different, so the product is different. Um, while you can apply certain studies, uh, proof of principle studies, or stability and shelf life studies on your warehouse components, which you already know and have pre-manufactured, it's not possible for your final drug product, which is unique for every patient, and certainly also applies to new antigens. So there are some limitations, and you have to get these products out fast to the patient. You cannot have like a one or two year study period until you give your personalized product. So with that, I'd like to close, and thank you very much for your attention.